Welcome back, everyone, to the Koalified podcast. I'm your host, Michael Zielinski. Today with me, I have Fitz Lee. Fitz, can you go ahead and introduce yourself and your business to everyone? Uh, yeah, so uh, my name is Fitz Lee, and my wife and I run a cleaning business here in California called Spring Into Clean. Awesome. Give me a background on yourself. Where were you born? Where did you grow up? All the good yeah. stuff. I, I actually grew up in Washington State, uh, kind of a small town. I uh, met my wife when I moved to California. She was uh, born and raised here. And um, we kind of both been cleaning our whole lives. You know, both of us came from pretty strict families as far as cleaning went. Um, I spent a little time, you know, doing janitorial work for the Parks and Rec up in Washington State. And um, yeah, well, we, we kind of decided to start our own business in uh, 2018. Excellent. Growing up favorite things to do as a kid? Uh, definitely playing outside. I was, uh, I was big into basketball. That was my favorite sport in the world. And uh, yeah, I played that through fifth grade until I kind of realized that I was probably never going to be tall enough to play <laughs> basketball. So uh, then I switched over to tennis. Um, and yeah, my, most of my life has just kind of been outside, you know, kid of the 90s. So we didn't have a lot of internet back then. Absolutely. I remember those days. And a little bit of Nintendo 64, Super Nintendo when that came out, but it was just cops and robbers outside going to the park, throwing the ball and coming home when the, the street lights came on, you know? Exactly. Like when uh, you can no longer see your hand in front of your face, that's pretty much when it was time to go home. For me, it was if the street light came on, then I'm already late <laughs> and I'm in trouble. So... But gotcha. that was a good indicator that if I'm within the block or two, then get try and sneak in quickly before I, I got found out. Yep, yep. Um, did you did you want to be an athlete when you grew up, like with tennis or any other sports? Or did you kind of know what you what you wanted at a young age? I feel like that's a question yeah. many people maybe or maybe not know. You know, I, I think when you're a kid, I mean, you. I didn't really have any aspirations of anything. I think I was just enjoying being a kid. Like I didn't want to be an astronaut or a, you know, a firefighter or anything like that. Um, but as I got older, maybe into my high school years, I think I started to, I've always kind of wanted to be a business owner. Once I got into high school and I started to kind of get, you know, um, more familiar with the types of careers that were out there. Um, I never really knew what type of business though. I think I just always wanted to be a business owner or like a CEO or, somebody in charge out of business. I think that's was my main goal. And uh, that, that's kind of what I went to school for. So. so what you went to college, what college did you go to? I actually went to the University of Hawaii. And um, I, I didn't finish though. Very nice. I, I transferred after about two years. Um, and it was just for me, it was just too hot and humid. So you know, I transferred back over here into one of the schools in California. Um, but I, I never finished. It was one of those things where I was kind of on my own and I had to work, you know, to pay bills. And the job that I got working at a bank, they, they kind of told me, like, I don't really need a degree. I mean, if my sales are strong, then they'll promote me. And that's kind of what happened. So it was one of those things where you start out part time and then they give you promotion and now you're working full time and then you have less time for school. And at a certain point, school just kind of became like this afterthought because it wasn't needed for banking. Um, but I didn't stay with the banking industry. You know, after a while I left and uh, people really stopped asking for, you know, a degree on my resume. They were more interested in my work experience. So I never really like crossed my mind to go back to school and, you know, take the time and the cost to do that. It wasn't really necessary. And just to be clear, did you, so you dropped out or you did graduate? Yeah, no, I dropped out. Yeah, I, I was okay. studying business and then I dropped out after, I guess my junior year is what you would call it. You know, somewhere yeah. in that you know, credits to be a junior. So you and me are the same junior year uh, college dropouts. I, <laughs> I mean, I went in for business management and and a minor in with finance. Um, but it just it hit me when I saw that I was learning straight from the book from all my professors and none of them ever own their own business. And that was the biggest thing, finding out that none of them were ever business owners or really in their field for more than three, four years before they got into teaching. So I was like, I'm not paying 
55, 60 K a year to go to school when I could pay a couple hundred bucks to get these books used and learn the same amount, you know? So, I mean, if you really wanted to learn the syllabus, you can, you know, look up any syllabus online and then just go to the bookstore and buy the books. Absolutely. It's, uh, it's crazy how, how much, especially I feel like in the last five years, the, the schooling with college has, has changed. I actually read something yesterday that said, uh, with indeed anybody who has a business management or marketing degree, it's nobody, nobody ever asks for those. It's you're better off getting an engineering degree, um, and, and learning business yourself. And, you know, it's, it is that much easier and it saves you more money going that route for sure. Um, anybody in your family, a business owner that you kind of learned off of? My, my dad was, I remember when I was a kid, he owned like this, uh, frozen fruit bar kind of stand. And, uh, we would go and he would set up shop at like our, the fairgrounds when it would come in just the summers and things like that. And we would sell fruit bars, you know, at the, uh, at near the gates or like, uh, sometimes if they let us in, you know, inside the, uh, the actual fairground area. And, uh, I loved it cause I got all the free frozen fruit bars I could eat. And I'm pretty sure I ate all his profits. <laughs> Yeah, that, I think that was like my, my first. As year. a kid, you 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 can't beat free food, especially when it's you know it, it's easy and accessible with with your family business. I mean, and it's good like that. Oh, I'd be I'd be snacking nonstop. Oh, yeah. Our house was like the the summer house because we had uh, one of those large like um, horizontal commercial freezers in our garage, and that would just be stacked with like hundreds of frozen fruit bars of all different like flavors. So friends would just come over to our house and, you know, at midday, you know, it's really hot outside. We just eat those all day long. What was your favorite flavor? I liked strawberry and lime. Those are my two favorites. Okay. I, I'm a big strawberry guy, so I'm sure I would enjoy those too. Going into the business now, you said you started in 2018 with your wife, right? Yeah. What inspired you guys to start your own cleaning service? You know, it was, it was interesting. I was working in tech at the time for a, a small startup and, uh, they, you know, they had to lay everyone off. And I kind of said going into that job, I was like, you know, I think this is my last startup. If this doesn't work, I'm just going to do something on my own. And, uh, you know, when they laid everyone off, um, we were kind of looking around and trying to figure out like what type of business we wanted to start. We knew that it had to be something that matched our skill set. We wanted something that had pretty low overhead and also something that was easy to explain. Like it took more than two sentences to explain what it is that we were selling. We didn't want any part of it. And for us, you know, that, that kind of landed us in the, in the cleaning business. So that's, uh, that's what we decided to do. And how much did you guys invest when you first started? I'd say about like 10 to 15,000 in the actual business, um, for just supplies and, uh, and marketing and, and things like that. Um, I think you could do it with a lot less, you know, we, we kind of went out there and bought what we thought we would need to expand the business to like two to four employees up front. Um, that way we didn't want, we didn't want to feel like we were behind any sort of demand that we got in. So we kind of jumped ahead of it and bought like a lot of supplies at once. Um, and then everything else went into marketing. We did a lot of paid advertising when we first started. So the, the bulk of it went to that. So you, you kind of went the, opposite route that most people usually go they try to start it up as quickly as possible with as little capital as possible but you guys had the capital and your mindset was let's grow this as quickly as possible with a couple employees and really get the ball rolling right off the bat well close like the we wanted to be prepared to have employees quicker than um like we didn't want to have to catch up to it one day. So we just wanted to have everything that we needed to get those employees up and running. But it took us a couple of years. Like we started in 2018, but we didn't really start hiring until middle of 2020, you know, after the pandemic and they started to say it was safe to go back out. That's when we first started hiring. And um, before that, it was just my wife and I going and doing every single cleaning. And we did it together. We, we figured out, okay, what equipment we definitely need. We figured out what equipment we don't need. And we figured out exactly how to price our, our services and then, you know, set everything up. So um, that, that was really invaluable to us. And, you know, we luckily, I think we probably had about 
70 percent of the stuff that we needed you know we had a really good vacuum which is probably the most expensive thing you'll buy and when we were ready to hire employees it went pretty quickly just because like we had that foundation kind of laid out and we had everything ready to go um, i think the downside to doing it that way is it is a larger capital investment than you need um so i i would i wouldn't recommend it to somebody <laughs> unless like they're like really ready to go and they, they kind of have a lot of things in place and they know exactly what to do um so but yeah i mean it worked out for us in the long run but um i think there's probably more yeah financially responsible ways of doing it i mean everybody that's the beauty of this industry is that there's not one correct way of doing it there's a hundred different great ways of doing it and as long as it works for you guys that's all that matters do you remember roughly what month in 2018 you started? Yeah, um, October. October 11th. October. So that was when we got our um, certification back from the Secretary of State saying that we're you know ready to go. And so that, that's what we consider our first uh, day in business. So from October to mid-2020, you and your wife were doing all the cleanings yourself. Yeah, we were working, you know, seven days a week. Um, I think like we would work 22 days in a row and then we usually have one day off because we just didn't have any customers that day. And uh, then we go right back to work. We got married in 2019. We didn't even take time for our honeymoon. We got married. Um, I think we left on a Friday and we came back on a Monday and you know, we were cleaning Tuesday. Oh my gosh, you guys are killing it. <laughs> any pl Have you taken a honeymoon yet or since or still no? No, not yet. You know, not, nothing like big. I think we've taken like little weekend trips here and there, um, but nothing that would really equate to a honeymoon yet. Soon enough, it'll be a, a big one that makes up for, for the delay. You know, you could fall out and go for a month <laughs> all over Europe or, or however you want to do it, you know? Yep, yep. Employees or independent contractors? You know, we went back and forth on that a lot at the beginning. Um, I had a buddy who started a business and they did independent contractors and um, you know their their biggest issue was maintaining quality and then you also have the issue of some of the independent contractors stealing your clients you know regardless of whatever contract you have them sign um, I think for us with our goals you know we wanted to create a company where we could do better by our employees and that meant being able to one day in the future offer benefits and do certain things that like um, a, a W-2 employee could actually take advantage of. Um, and we wanted more control over the quality of, uh, of our services. You know, we, we felt like that was a big deal for us and we didn't want to just outsource it to somebody who we couldn't really like say, hey, we need to train you better on this and that. Um, so we, we wanted a little bit more control over that area. So we went the W-2 route. Um, I will say though that the W-2 route, um, twice as much work, pretty much the same profit margin. For you, though, in California, I would say possibly less of a headache because you don't have to worry about, you know, how the state rules with independent contractors. You're, you're automatically employees. So as long yeah. as you make those guidelines, you're good. Yeah, it's a trade off. You know, like we don't have to worry about that, but you do have to worry about, you know, um, expenses like uh, employee taxes and sick pay and like all the other HR stuff that kind of comes along with it. Um, unemployment. Unemployment. Then you have to worry about staffing. It's not as easy as, um, as having a contractor. Uh, cause you could, you could, you know, sign a contract with a hundred contractors if you wanted. And if you didn't have the demand to fill every single one of their days, it's not a huge deal, but you can't have a hundred W2 employees just sitting there idle. That costs a lot of money and tons of turnover. And it's, it's a lot harder to manage. So I think there's kind of a trade-off and really just kind of depends on where your comfort zone is and, and which you know, challenges you want to tackle. Absolutely. Um, how many employees do you have now in total with cleaners or any office staff, including yeah, yourself and your wife? We're at four employees and then there's myself and my wife. So I have six total. Um, it's We did have eight last year, but the... A lot of things have kind of slowed down. A few of our employees have, uh, you know, moved out of state. Some have, you know, decided to go into different fields. So right now we're, we're holding steady at four. And revenue wise, what have you guys done in total since you first started? 
in total, we're getting close to 400,000. I think we're right under like 380, something like that right now. And um, that we're probably going to hit around 160 this year, uh, which is a little bit of a drop from last year. Last year, we ended at, I think, 180. And in 2018, because you started in October, when did you get your first booking? I think it was about two weeks after we opened. Um, so towards, okay. the, towards the, no, wait, sorry. It wasn't until like November because uh, we were building the website and uh, we were looking for like a booking software systems to implement. So we were getting all that kind of stuff done in the meantime. So I think it was early part of November and it was a, uh, it was a move out cleaning. I remember um, I, I went and I did that one on my own. Luckily it was a small apartment and it wasn't too bad, but it was a okay. yeah. And I mean, with all the different cleaning businesses, of course, across the US and in California, what unique value are you guys bringing to to your area? You know, I, I when we started, I would have said it was that we pay, you know, our employees a living wage and that we provide a service that we really kind of stand behind. Like, you know, we, we don't just throw policies at customers saying, this is our policy, sorry, we can't bend it for you. Um, but the more business owners I've met, the more I realize that most of them are kind of selling the same sort of, um, you know, uh, the same sort of thing and the same sort of benefits. So I don't really think that's anything unique to us anymore. Um, aside from the fact that we're just a small family company and some people prefer that versus going with like a large corporate franchise. For sure. When you, when you have a, a face to put it behind, on, especially if you have like an about you on, on, on your website and you could add you and your wife in there and they could see, you know, family run. I know it hits closer to home with a lot of people who rather use a family run service versus a corporate franchise and things like that. And with, you know, having employees, you can build up that brand recognition a lot stronger because they could wear uniforms. They can leave, you know, any print marketing for you um, since they are employees and not independent contractors. So that also helps to build your value with your customers in that sense. Yeah. I like that, you know, for us, I think a big thing for us is just being able to take care of the people that we're responsible for. And, and that means both our clients and our employees. And without being like a huge corporation, we don't have all these layers to like get approval through. So if we want to kind of like, customize the surface for a customer or we want to be a little bit more understanding about whatever situation kind of pops up for them or our employees you know we have the freedom to do that which is nice and there's not a whole lot of like corporate red tape that we have to go through we just decide to do it 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 does feel good in that sense when obviously being a business owner you guys make the final say and the final decision so you don't have to worry about is this going to go through Maybe if you're going to your wife about a certain thing, then you might have to get the okay on it. But either way, it's you guys are at the top, so you don't really have those issues. Challenges. What have been some of those biggest challenges you both have faced since starting? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I would say um, staffing is the biggest one. You know, there's always kind of this seesaw of like you have way too many employees and not enough business. Then you have too much business, not enough employees. So you're just always kind of catching up on one end of the seesaw or the other. Um, the, we were told early on, you know, that the best advice somebody could give us is that you never want to stop advertising and you never want to stop hiring. And that that's a big thing, you know, because sometimes if you stop hiring and all of a sudden you have a problem employee, you're going to feel like you're kind of like held hostage by that employee until you find somebody else to replace them. And that's never anything that you want to have in your business because you really just kind of are, you know, risking, you know, a bad service or a bad experience for your customers down the line. Um, I had a manager who used to say better a hole than an a-hole. And uh, I, I <laughs> try to live my life according to that and, you know, do our, our um, recruiting and, uh, you know, hiring strategies based on that. And, Basically, that just means, you know, it's it's better to not have enough employees or not send somebody to a job than to send the wrong person and leave a bad impression. Uh, Absolutely. 
you know, that, that could just have ripple effects. So staffing has been one of the biggest issues for us. Um, a lot of it changed during the pandemic. You know, before the pandemic, we would put up a job ad and you'd get like 90 people applying to the job ad in the span of 30 days. And, you know, for the, the next couple of years, up until about like three months ago, we would put a job ad out and we maybe would get 15 people would apply over the course of like 90 days. So like you just saw that application rate tank. And about three months ago, it started to go back up. You know, we're getting into 20, 30 people applying, you know, for you know, each 30 day period. And the candidates are good. You know, it's people that actually have experience and have a, you know, a track record of doing this type of work versus people who are just kind of like tired of working at, you know, a fast food chain or something like that. That's good. And do you think it's attributed to the work from home culture where, you know, since the pandemic started, everything got shifted to online and everybody's, you know, gotten used to that and used to working from home and don't want to go back in. Um, yeah. But now potentially with the way the economy is going into, you know, the holiday season, you think it's because of that? You think people are got a push to get, you know, maybe another job to get them out of the house and, and to pick up some extra income? You know, I, I don't know if I would like squarely blame it on that. I do think that the pandemic shifted people's perception of work and what's valuable in their work-life balance. So I think that they're realizing that they don't want to just work a dead end job unless they absolutely love it. You know, there's other things that they can do with their life. And I think the freedom and the flexibility that they're looking for, I think they're finding it in gig work like DoorDash and Uber and things like that. So I think that's taking a chunk of the workforce out of, uh, you know, our applicant pool. Uh, I, so, yeah, I think it's those two things more so than like the work from home, because I don't, I don't think the people who want jobs where you work from home are the same people that would apply for a job where you're physically active eight hours a day. So I, there may be some crossover, but I don't think it's significant enough. That's a good point because, you know, somebody who is home all day might just pick up another job that is work from home so they could just continue to be home. And on the flip side, you might have a small percentage of people who are home all day and they do want to get out of the house and kind of meet meet some new people and and just maybe get some exercise. But going into cleaning, like you said, for eight hours a day from staying home eight hours a day, that's a huge, huge difference. And where Uber or DoorDash, that plays a role for sure for people coming in and into those things. People like that flexibility because, again, that gives them the ability to say, like, I want to work or I don't want to work because I have a family event. That means more to me than, you know, doing whatever gig work is out there. And, um, you know, the, most of the employees that we or the candidates that we interview, they'll usually say the reason they like cleaning or the reason they want this job is some combination of, like, they like to clean, they like to be active, they like to talk to people, like, they like to be out in the world. Um, so I, I think that, you know, driving around an Uber or like delivering that kind of maybe gives people a bit of a sense of being out in the world while still having control over their free time. For sure. I mean, I was a delivery driver for, for 10 years for an Italian restaurant and when the pandemic hit and everything shut down, I was still going in cause we were deemed essential. Um, and just driving around at that time was was crazy because you do not in a pandemic obviously see kids playing in the park and people walking their dogs and just having conversations but that first two months it was like almost like a zombie apocalypse movie where nobody is out and you just everybody's masked up and not even I mean, I was taking a, money from envelopes that were taped to mailboxes and I would be dropping the food at their door, getting back to my car, and then they would finally come out and get the food. So huge, huge, crazy difference that is versus, you know, what was before. And I feel like what we're in now is not, we're not the same as we were before. We're trying to, but the world has shifted so much that I feel like 
a lot of people still have it in the back of their mind. Like, what if this happens again? You got to kind of be prepared for it. So, and that's where I feel like the work-life balance has come into a huge, huge effect too. You know, so yeah. many people lost loved ones and things like that. They, they don't want to grind away 60 hours a week and not really use that money for anything, not enjoy their lives. So it's, it's hard. I, it's, it's hard. It's, 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 I think he hit it, you know, on the, on the nose there. And, you know, people, when you lose somebody, I think people just kind of put different things into perspective and they're like, you know what, maybe my job is not that important. I mean, job, everybody needs a job, you know, they're important to sustain your life, but it shouldn't be your everything, you yeah. know, biggest, I mean, the biggest thing I've always heard from is people referencing, well, if I died today, my employer is going to have a job posting to fill my position the next day. Yeah. So not every company is like that. You know, I feel like more family run businesses like yourself are trying to build that brand where you are a family within the business so that they don't feel that way. You know, they could work better and enjoy their lives at the same time. And that's why I feel like a new wave of entrepreneurs was coming from the pandemic because of that reason as well. They will get a little, they will put in the same amount of hours, if not more in the first couple of years, but then it'll drastically cut back and, and that work-life balance will get a lot better. Yeah. I, I know that for us, it was really important that, you know, we've worked for bosses in the past where they just really didn't make us feel like we were valued or kind of felt like we were disrespected some of the time or that we were like way down on this sort of like corporate totem pole. And we, we didn't want that when we created our business, you know, we wanted people to actually feel like they were supported and respected and, you know, that we stood behind them. You know, it's, it's one of those things where I try not to sell people that, you know, we, we think of our employees like family or we treat you like family. I, I think that gets overused and it's turned into just kind of yeah. a marketing selling point. But what I tell people is that I understand you have your own family. I understand you have things outside of this job that are more important than cleaning somebody else's toilet. And all I ask is that you communicate with me and let me know what you need. And I will try to do everything I can to rework your schedule so that you can take care of those things. Because at the end of the day, like cleaning somebody else's toilet or their kitchen or mopping their floors or whatever it is, like it's not more important than your own health and happiness and your own family. So I, I really believe that. And that's one of the things where we look for employees who really want that and want to kind of grow a business that encompasses that sort of culture. For sure. It's communication, honesty, and trust. Three biggest things for, I'd say, any relationship you could have with any person, whether it be a spouse, a sibling, uh, a boss, I mean, a stranger on the sidewalk. Those yeah. three things, as long as you have that, Everything goes smoothly, you know, yeah. you, you relieve so much headache and fighting. Yeah. Surprisingly, it's, it's not cleaning. That's the most important part of this job. It's that it's communicating with, you know, your clients and with anybody else that needs to be in the loop and you do that. Well, your clients will respect you. They'll trust you. They'll see that you really care about caring for them and their home. And that's going to be like more than half the experience right there. You know, cleaning is not that difficult. It's not rocket science. You're literally just wiping off a surface. It's not hard. Exactly. It's going into somebody's home. They're paying you so that they could free up their time and do something else. If the communication isn't there between the business and the customer, well, they're not going to trust you. They're, yeah. How can they trust you? They're going to take their money, go elsewhere and, and find the next best suitor for them who can give that to them because that's what they're paying for it, you know? I mean, they're not, like you said, it's not just the cleaning because, you know, it's not rocket science. They could have their 13, 14 year old kid do it, or they could do it, you know, but they're paying you so that their time is freed up. Yeah. And, and that's the thing. Like if you want to be successful in this kind of industry, you can't sell cleaning. 
because everybody sells cleaning. It's like going and buying a pencil at like a number two pencil at the store. It's highly substitutable because they're all the same. And the differences between each one are negligible. The, the only thing that really makes your product sticky is the way that your employees are and how they interact with your customers and how well your customers like the way that they deal with the support team and your, and your housekeeper and, and things like that. Like that's, that's the number one differentiator between any business and the business down the street. And there's so much competition and there's so much demand for this clean service that like you, you really have to be careful about how you're presenting yourself because it's easy for somebody to switch over. It's very, very 100%. That was my next question was how are you differentiating yourself from your competitors? And I mean, you already said it, you hit the nail on the head there. You got to give that trust and communication. Yeah. Yeah, you really do. For I mean, sure. it's one of those things like we're not perfect. You know, we've, we've done a bad job at people's houses before we've had complaints. Every cut, every business will, but it's a matter of how you deal with it. Like, is, is your customer going to feel like they have to fight with you just to get a resolution? Or are you going to actually kind of like really stand behind your product and service and be like, Hey, sorry, we made a mistake. You're right. Let's figure out how to make this better and, and kind of move forward from there. It's, um, that's what I believe. Anyway, I, I think, you know, <laughs> there may be other ways to handle that, but that, that's my opinion. I mean, their businesses, they have no refund policies. I mean, you could set it up in a way where it's, you know, you have your no refund policy, you go and reclean. Maybe they're not, you could send the same cleaner to reclean. Maybe they don't want them. Then you'll send somebody else. There's ways to go about that. But with, I feel like if a customer is nagging you enough, just, just refund them and let the headache go away because yeah. we, you're just uh, going to keep fighting for a little bit of money for no reason. Yeah. We, we have a, we have a no refund policy. Um, you know, we just do recleans. And the main reason we do that is because we've had people try to scam us in the past. And um, we know that because like we had a friend who was a, a property manager at a property. And so they suggested to one of their clients that they hire us to clean for them. We did, and we felt like we did a good job, you know, and uh, then we got a complaint and we had our friend go in and check the property and they said it was totally fine. And you know, that, that tenant was just a problem tenant, their whole, their whole lease there with them. So, um, you know, we kind of learn from those sorts of issues. And when you explain it to customers like that, you know, you just let them know, like, hey, you know, we've had people try to scam us. We haven't had anybody complain about that. They, they, everybody that we've told that to has been totally fine with that. And I think most people would understand unless they're the person that's trying to scam you. Right. If they're coming at you right off the bat, well, why not? What if this, what if that? They're not your target customer. They're clearly trying to pull one over on you. You just give them a, another quick 10 second explanation. Why, if they keep going, just say, thank you for your time. We're not your fit. Go to the next person, you know, and it's not every customer is your customer. Yeah. And I think people get scared because they're worried that they'll get a bad customer review on like Yelp or Google or wherever. And I don't think you should be afraid of that. I think you should welcome that because that customer is giving you a platform to then reply and people will see how you handle that situation. That reply means way more than that customer's complaint. Most people will look at a customer complaint and think like, oh, this guy's just crazy. And so if you handle it right, you'll get the right types of clients that come back in. You'll get the clients that look at what you did to handle that situation and say, I like that. I want that kind of company working for me. And you'll get the right type of clients back. So I, I say, welcome those bad reviews, you know, like don't fight them over it, respond politely, um, but don't be scared of it. You know, if, if you really truly believe you're doing the right kinds of things for your customers and your employees, then there's no reason for you to be worried about a public review. 100% you are completely right because if you go about it correctly, be as polite as possible, in-depth explanation so that you could show other potential people looking at the review what steps were taken 
that will bring in so many people who might just read that you have one star, but not necessarily if they didn't read into it and they just saw one star, they would leave. But then there's others who look at the one stars and see if there's responses. The ones that will take the time to respond and see, okay, that was a problem customer. This company is responding correctly, politely. I trust them. I'll still give them a shot because it seems like that was a one-off situation and they will take care of me the way they took care of that person. Now, if you respond in the wrong way and you're shooting yourself in the foot, you are going to lose customers and you are going to make yourself and your brand look terribly. If you start cussing or you start, you know, belittling the people, it's, that's not how you go about it. That's nobody wants that. Even if that person was in the wrong, don't do it. If you're mad, take a day to chill out, come back, read it with a fresh pair of eyes and then respond. Cause if you're going to go in there with some heat, <laughs> it's going to end badly. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely recommend kind of like, you know, pull up like a word doc or something, write out whatever you want to write out at first. Let it sit for a night and, and then come back and, then, you know, edit it. Or, I mean, there's, we have AI now, chat GPT and Bard. You can put your prompt in there and tell them, tell it to write it for you. <laughs> Just <laughs> copy and paste it over if you really don't want to spend the time. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would so, recommend, like, whatever you're going to say, like, just be sincere about it and be honest. Don't give away too much, you know, just say what you need to and nothing more. Um, but at that point, like you've really already kind of lost that customer. So that review is more for your next customer than it is the one that you're responding to. Absolutely. Yeah. Huge. That is huge. They're a lost cause. Let them go. It's how are you moving forward now with everyone else taking a look at the, that review? Yeah. So. In relation to these customers, what are the strategies you guys are using to attract and retain them? Yeah, you know, we um, we don't do any paid advertising anymore. Um, it helped at the beginning, you know, to get kind of a fast start. You know, it definitely helped. But, you know, when you look back at it, we were kind of breaking even on it. You know, we'd spend seven or eight thousand dollars in a quarter on paid ads and it would generate, you know, about eight or nine thousand dollars in revenue. Um, now, some of those turned into, you know, recurring clients. Some of them were just like one-time cleanings. Um, so if you were to like count up, you know, all the money we've made from recurring clients that we got from ad revenue, I think you'd see, you know, a little bit better of an ROI. But generally speaking, what we found is that the ads, the paid ads are expensive and the clients that we get don't tend to be as sticky um, or they don't refer out as much. Um, they're kind of more like a, just give me my cleaning service kind of a client and <laughs> don't mess up kind of a thing. Um, for us, what we found worked better was posting to job boards or, or you know, finding people, or not job boards, right, um, like community boards um, that were a little bit more focused or intimate, um, you know, going out in your community and kind of figuring out, is there like a, a, a mommy, daddy sort of parenting job, uh, you know, community board somewhere where people are looking for housekeepers. Um, is there, um, you know, like a, a Facebook group or something where people are actively kind of looking for cleaning help in, in some way? Um, Next door has actually been pretty good because it's local. Uh, so you can be, you know, you, you have a little bit more of that uh, personal experience there. And we've noticed that a lot of people do refer when they come in from those sorts of, uh, I guess, more, more personal channels. Um, another way that we've been marketing is like we will go out to other businesses that we think have similar customers. For example, we partnered with a uh, a pickup and delivery laundry service a while back, and we okay. we, we customized like a uh, a coupon code for them. You know, we said uh, you know it was like fifty plus the name of the company, and they would get fifty dollars off their cleaning if you know they used this uh, laundry service and they were a customer of that laundry service. Then they got discounts at our company as well. And they did the same, you know, like we, we um, sent out an email blast to all of our customers saying, Hey, we just partnered with this company. If you use our custom like uh, marketing code, it'll give you a discount on laundry services. So, you know, finding 
companies like that that have people who are willing to like book online or kind of outsource some of their daily chores at home or, or house maintenance um, has worked really well for us. You know, it's it those people stayed around for a long time. We found that they were very nice people on top of that. And uh, it was much more cost effective than the online ads. Especially starting out, if somebody who, you know, wants to get into this business doesn't want or doesn't really have the money to hire out somebody or get them the supplies, you could start up yourself, you know, get yourself an account on Booking Koala, put yourself as the provider, and then make your website real nice and simple, put in your logo. And then, like you said, Facebook community groups that are like localized to where you're at, post in there for free and you'll you could potentially have a job that same day or the next day, you yeah. know, and then work on that. And next door too, I've been hearing more and more people say that they're straying away from the paid ads and going to more localized avenues because it's working better. You know, why pay? if it's not the best ROI when you can do something for free and still get a return. Exactly. There are, um, there are like some local magazines too, that like, um, well, you know, they will target a specific kind of zip code and they will write, you know, articles and they'll put ads in the, in there for th that specific community. You know, it'll be like, you know, uh, Oakland community, <laughs> whatever, you know, the name of the magazine or, you know, and I, I would reach out to them too, because we, we wrote, or we, uh, we published an article and, you know, they did kind of an interview with us. And from that one article in one month, we got like five or 10, uh, I think it was like seven new clients reaching out to us and three of them actually booked recurring services. With us. So it was, it was good. You know, I mean, they can be kind of expensive upfront and I know people worry about like, well, if it's print advertising, I can't really track the uh the number of like clicks and you know views and all that kind of stuff um i, I would just say like look at the expense you know if it costs you five hundred dollars to run that ad and it generated you know fifteen hundred in revenue you're making money off of it and, and it worked out um but those people they, they trust those publications more because again because they're more local and they're more targeted to the interests of their like immediate neighborhood so i think you kind of get you know a, a customer that's a little further down the sales cycle and is much more willing to purchase because of that sort of um, word of mouth and, and that sort of like verification, I guess, that they get from you being in that local newspaper or ad or whatever. Um, and then we also joined, For sure. and joined a, uh, a business networking group too. Um, so I, you could look around your, uh, your community to see what kind of networking groups there are. But essentially ours was, you know, we met with, you know, this group once a week. And it was all business owners from different types of industries. They only allow one owner per industry. So for example, like we were the house cleaner for that group, they weren't gonna bring in another cleaning company. But there are people that have like, you know, auto shops, catering companies and all this sorts of stuff. And the idea is that you meet once a week, you talk to each other and you try to figure out how to refer each other business. And th that was incredibly lucrative for us. Um, I think part of the issue we ran into is that, you know, we were doing that during the pandemic and they, they did all their meetings via Zoom. And then after the pandemic, they went back to in-person meetings. We weren't quite ready to do that yet. So we, you know, we didn't renew our membership. And, um, but, you know, I think we, we may start doing that again once we have a little bit more time to actually join the meetings. Because the meetings are about two hours long for, for at least like the organization that we joined. And we don't always have that time commitment to, to go there. And, you know, I think we could only miss like two meetings in like a, a 90 day period or something like that. So, so, um, oh, wow. Yeah. But before they boot you. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of like a soft boot. I think they kind of just more talk to you about it. Um, but it was really helpful for us because, you know, you network with a lot of different people and you get to know a lot of different people and, and you know, it, it helped us quite a bit. Um, so I, I would say, you know, they, people should look into that too and, and see what's um, available in their community. I feel like partnerships and partnerships, collaborations, um, are so underlooked, underlooked or overlooked, you know, that they, they could just get passed by where every, you know, everybody starting up is like, well, I just social, I got a Facebook ads, Instagram ads, TikTok ads, 
whatever, um, Google AdWords, Google LSA, that's the only way I'm going to make, make money off getting marketing. Then when you can partner up with a pool cleaning service, you know, if you're out West in the warm States, you know, that's doing pool cleanings all year round, partner up with them. Like you, like yourself, partner up with a mobile laundry service or a mobile car detailing. Those are huge because now you open up your business to them, allowing them access to your customers and vice versa. You partner with one pool cleaning company and one mobile car detailer, and now you've tripled your potential customers. Yep. So, and there, it's somebody that they know that's vouching for you. So they're kind of doing the legwork for you. You know, it's just, it's, it's just a much better sales process altogether. Um, and then that's the reason we haven't gone back to paid is because we really believe that there's a much better way to just grow organically, you know, word of mouth kind of thing. I, I guess it's kind of still a little bit old school marketing, you know, back in the day, just word of mouth, but it still works, you know, and especially for a, a service that's as intimate as this, you know, people are letting you into their homes when your home does not look its best and they, they right. may feel embarrassed about it, but they, they may feel better knowing that you came highly recommended from somebody else that they trust. Absolutely. I mean, if it were me, am I going to trust, you know, my best friend recommending a service or am I going to trust what Google says and the reviews that are on there when you can't necessarily trust it all? You know, it could have been 20 of their friends who left those reviews and you don't know. Yeah. But if it's if it's someone close to you, like a family member or a very close friend, of course, you're not going to say, oh, no, unless you've already tried it and had a bad experience with them. But if if they're recommending and you're looking, there's nothing better. Yeah, exactly. For sure. Financial management and planning. How how are you guys handling that? You know, luckily, my wife's mom is an accountant, so we get a lot of free advice from her. So you lucked out. Yeah, we, we kind of lucked out. Uh, so it's it's one of those things where we leave most of that up to her. My job is basically just to like go in and tag all of our transactions correctly to make sure that they're like, you know, this is, uh, you know, communications, this goes under this group, that kind of a thing. Um, and then it's really just about keeping an eye on your expenses. Uh, you know, I, I have several different spreadsheets that are designed to keep an eye on like how much each job is costing us, what parts of the job are costing us the most. Is it the actual cleaning? Is it driving to the job? Is it picking up equipment? You know, all sorts of things. I would break down every job kind of like that. And that helps me, you know, at the end of the quarter when I'm looking at things to figure out, okay, what kind of tweaks do we need to make in our business to make it more efficient, to either save us money, to, you know, can we pay this person more, that kind of a thing. And so I think it's it's very important to just stay on top of all of your costs and know exactly what it's costing you. And more importantly, what each employee is costing you. At the end of the day, you kind of have to know that. Otherwise, you could have a problem that's just skating under the radar and you'll never know about it. And eventually you, you, you might look at your books at the end of the year and be like, I could have made an extra like four or $5,000 if I had cut this expense or if I'd handled this differently. So it's, it's important to stay on top of that. Having just a sense of, you don't have to be the greatest at it. You don't have to be the world's best accountant. You don't have to go hire the most expensive accountant. As long as you know that you just need to, kind of keep track of these things and check in on it like weekly or monthly, depending on what, what it is you're checking in on is going to be huge. Like you said, at the end of the year, come tax time where it's like, wow, if I would have caught this in month three of this year, I would have been up another $20,000. And that's, you know, it could be a car that you buy for an employee for them to drive with your branding on. It could be all of next year's supplies. You know, it's, it is huge to, to know, but it shouldn't kill you and hurt your time in the business trying to learn all of it. Yeah. I think some people, if anybody is worried that to put together a spreadsheet, you have to put together some like, crazy long formula that's really complicated. I, I, I urge you just to 
split every calculation up into a different cell, you know, figure out, okay, like, this is how many hours we took at this job. This is what this person is paid per hour. So they were paid this. Multiply it by like the employee taxes that you have to pay, your workers comp, insurance, whatever that is, like just break it out in every single column. And eventually you'll be able to see exactly where all of your money is going. And it'll really help out because all of the transactions that I do, all the calculations are like simple multiplication or division or addition or whatever. There's nothing crazy complicated in there at all. It's um, so right. I, there's a, a real benefit to keeping it very simple and um, kind of breaking everything out into little chunks because you can see more that way. 100%. It, what, it's the KISS method. Keep yeah. it simple, stupid. You know, don't don't overdo it. Just as simple as possible. And if if you do do it and you're still confused and you're part of the Booking Koala community group on Facebook, you could make a post saying, hey, you know, I'm in this area. This is kind of how I run things. Doing a breakdown of my numbers. This is what it looks like. I'm still kind of confused if this is good or bad. What are your guys' thoughts? And there's going to be people who are in running their business very similar to you and they'll give you like they'll give you an explanation if it's close to them if it's not tips anything like the community i've learned over the last several years is super super helpful nobody even if you're in the same city as another cleaning service nobody's trying to gatekeep you from from doing doing well because the smart business owners know that not every customer is their customer and they might that their the customer is not for them is probably yours so why not help them out because one day they might be helping you out you know with when it comes to positive company culture how are you and your wife handling that yeah i think the the first thing you have to figure out is that you can't point blame right away. You know, like if you get a customer that writes in and they're not happy with something and they said like, oh, such and such did a bad job cleaning for me the other day. I think initially a lot of people want to just believe the customer and they're already like smacking their forehead thinking like, why did this person mess up? How could they have messed up? This seems like so easy to avoid. Um, I think you have to try to push that down and you have to reach out to your employee and just ask them and, and say, hey, this is what we heard. Can you elaborate? Can you tell me more about what happened? Like you have to show your employees that you're there to support them first and foremost and not there to blame them for something that went wrong. And they're going to be a lot more open with you about stuff. And they're going to want to try to help you to figure it out. Because at the end of the day, you know, my wife and I don't really clean anymore. We sit in the office and, you know, we manage stuff from here. So we rely on our employees to tell us what's going on in the field and help us figure out, you know, what's working, what's not working. And we try to treat them like partners and, and treat them like they're a part of the process. You know, we, before we implement a new policy, we always reach out and we say, hey, let's talk real quick. Even if it's just like 20 or 30 minutes, this is kind of the problem that we're seeing. What do you guys think we should do? What would work best? Like what, you know, what's your opinion? And they they feel better about that. They feel included. They feel valued. And, you know, they, they feel like they have a bit of ownership over things. So I, I think that that's the biggest part of company culture is just making your employees feel like they're part of something and not like they're a subordinate of some sort, just being told what to do. For sure. It's going back to that, that point that we were saying a little bit ago is that communication and honesty. As yeah. long once you have that, you know, and you're showing it with your employees, it's going to go so far. Your like, shitty situation that might have happened with a customer, as long as, like you said, you're not just siding with the customer right away and you're trying to open that conversation with the employee to see what happened, it could be that much better just because of that extra step. If you come into the employee and start you know, bring them in, in the office and start yelling at them like crazy. Why did you do this? Why did you do that? But you didn't know the other facts of the matter from the bad on the customer. Well, you probably just lost an employee because why would they want to stay for somebody who is belittling them for 
for not hearing them out exactly. in the first place, you know? Even if that employee doesn't quit so, right away, they're, they may not put the same amount of effort into the job. So it's, it's one of those things where just, you know, don't, don't resort to yelling. It's like your first instinct, you know? They'll have it in their back of their mind that, all right, there's like a check mark already next to that owner or manager saying like, you know, that situation wasn't handled nowhere near properly or how I would like it. So like, their work will potentially be affected. Maybe not right away, maybe in a couple days, but it still can happen. And, and if, if it does, then one way or another, they're going to leave because customers will get upset that the house isn't perfect or, or you're going to get upset with just all the calls that are coming in. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if one of our employees gets a bad review, like the way that we approach it is like, you know, this is what your review was. Let's see what we can do to help you avoid getting that in the future or how to handle that situation on site. If it's something that needs to be handled on site. And a lot of times we find out like there were gaps in their training or like a tool wasn't working properly. And, you know, we find out a lot of information that just helps the company in general, you know, improve. And that's feedback that we wouldn't have gotten if we just started going in there guns blazing and just, you know, throwing out, uh, you know, blame left and right. So I highly recommend that go in, be curious, ask a lot of questions. As much of that will go so far again, keep hammering that down of, you know, keeping the line of communication through everything is going to help the you as the business owner learn too, because there might be things that you didn't know beforehand. And now you're learning, okay, well, in this scenario, this happened. And this is how I handled it. From that effect, you might know, okay, they were pissed so that that wasn't the right way to handle it, or it turned out great because we had a great conversation. So that's maybe how I should handle it and maybe tweak some small things there. Uh, with, with running a business, how, how do you prioritize your time, especially running it with your, your partner, with your wife? How do you guys prioritize that? Yeah, I think, uh, it's an interesting question. I, I mean, you kind of have to look at each situation, I, I think as its own situation and figure out how big of an impact that kind of has to everything else that's going on in the day. Like one thing we will look at is, is something time sensitive. You know, if something is needs to be done by the end of the day, then obviously that's going to get take higher priority than something that can wait two or three days or even till next week to handle. Um, then there's things like how big of an impact is it? You know, was, was this something where we, pissed off like a big commercial client and we're about to lose like 20% of our monthly revenue? Or is this where we have a legacy client who's been with us since like day one. And even though they're a small client, you know, they've supported us through everything and they just had a couple of complaints here and there. Like, I think you kind of have to look at that and decide for yourself, like which one is the most important. Um, and I, I think we try to use metrics like, how much something will cost to do, how much time it will take to resolve as more of a tiebreaker versus trying to just do the right thing by whoever that is that's making the complaint. I, I think for us, it's it's always take care of the person first, you know, do your best uh, and then look at things like urgency, you know, is there a deadline and then cost, um, you know, third should, should be like the last thing you really look at. Um, that, that doesn't mean that cost isn't going to be the overall you know, determination. Again, if, you're, if you've got a client that is big and they're about to take 20% of your revenue away for the month, um, that's probably going to get bumped up to the top of the list, unfortunately. For sure. Because at the end of the day, if you lose 20%, like, you might have to say goodbye to a chunk of your, your, um, you know, your employees at the same time. So it's, um, it's tough. You know, I, I can't say that there's like one formula that we use to figure out every single situation. I think that we just try to do the right things and we try to prioritize based on, you know, time and, and cost. What about just kind of staying on the same topic here? 
work-life balance because we already touched it a little bit earlier but not with you personally and now work-life balance (laughs) again with your partner being your business partner being your wife your life partner so how are you guys managing that now i i will say booking koala has played a big part in this just because of all the different things that the software can handle and all the different automated like messaging that kind of goes out to handle certain things I mean, when we first started the business, we were working this thing like, you know, 16, 20 hours a day, but it was on our mind, like 24 hours a day kind of a thing. But as we've kind of automated processes and we've gotten used to certain things and we've kind of figured out for us to now just have those um, do not disturb periods. And basically on my phone, I'm available from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Friday. Anything that comes in after that, I don't look at, I don't see, I don't think about. And it's one of those things where it was hard to let go at first because you're worried that some part of the business is going to fall apart if you're not constantly looking at it. But again, you have software programs like Booking Koala that are handling a lot of that in the background, like billing people, reminding them about their next appointments that are coming up, um, assigning you know cleaners to places, getting feedback after the, the job is done, like all sorts of these things that are kind of coming in and automated because of the software. So it's really just the mindset of learning to like, let go and try to turn your brain off during those personal hours and allowing yourself to have that time to just decompress and and live a life. Um, And, you know, we we tell our employees the same thing. You know, we we let them know that we're not going to answer anything after, you know, our do not disturb hours. And they can still text and call us and leave us a message and we'll get to it the next day. And I think as long as you know that, like, again, this is just cleaning. It's not like you're handling nuclear codes or anything like that. There's no emergency in the cleaning business that can't wait till the next day to figure out. Um, I mean, if there's an injury on site, you know, I think that would be like the one thing people would say like, oh, what do you do if there's somebody that's injured? It's like, I'm at my office several miles away. They need to call an ambulance or a doctor or something like that. I can't do anything to, to like save their life or anything like that. My job comes in afterwards where I'm trying to figure out Do I refund the customer? Are we going to go back and clean up? All those sorts of things. Those are non-emergency things, though. The thing that counts and that makes the most sense is is that person's physical health, which, again, I can't do anything about. So I I think that's the one thing that people might think they need to be online for every second of the day. But it's not true. You know, it's one of those things where you just have to allow yourself to decompress and have those office hours and then not work during that time. That's a really good point because, I mean, pretty much after six, if it's not a huge corporation that you got to get in contact with, like you said, there's nothing you can't re- you can really do until eight a.m. the next day when everything opens back up. I mean, if if it's something between you and the customer that could be communicated, again, if it's huge, it could still probably wait till the next morning it's 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 not you know unless you said like you said if it's life or death like a cleaner slipped in while cleaning the bathtub and and hit their head well i hope to god that if somebody was in the home when it was being clean they heard it and they called 911 or if the cleaner had their phone with them they called you know exactly yeah. besides that Besides that, there, like you said, there's after hours, there's not much you can do as the owner and unless things open up the next day. If, if you have a business that will crumble because one bad thing happened overnight, that really kind of points to a larger issue within, you know, business. So. For sure. You, you, you need some reevaluating on how things are run and what steps you take to get to that point. Cause if, like you said, one thing can implode, one bad thing can implode your business after hours. If you don't answer the phone, something majorly wrong there and, <laughs> and, and you need to change it. Yeah. I mean, even if it's like somebody that's calling out for a shift the next day, you know, it's it's still the same thing. It's you can tackle it tomorrow. You can reach out to the customer and say, "Hey, such and such had a personal emergency. I apologize, but let's reschedule." And most customers will always understand. I mean, you'll have one or two here and there that'll throw a fit, but 
again, it's not something that's worth you worrying about at like eight o'clock at night when you're trying to hang out with your family or enjoy a good movie on TV or whatever it is you want to do in your life. Especially when, if it is in that situation and you are answering the phone, you're going to be reaching out to other cleaners who are trying to do the same thing at their homes yep. who are not going to respond to you. So exactly. now you're just sending an open-ended text, hopefully getting a response from somebody who does have availability at that time to come in when they might, yeah, they have it available on the schedule, but it was probably available on the schedule because they had to do other things elsewhere yeah. and, and, and they couldn't take it in the beginning. Yeah. We make the same promise to our employees. Like we don't bother them outside of those hours. If it's before 8 AM or after 6 PM, I'm not contacting anybody. You know, that's, I, I think that, you know, we have to respect their privacy just as much as we ask them to respect our personal time. For sure. And it kind of goes back to the hiring process where I saw something recently, actually in the group, it was posted. Somebody mentioned that they don't book their cleaners, I think more than 25, tw like 25 to 28 hours a week so that they can still have some leeway to do things, you know, travel to and from jobs. But also once that cleaner hits that mark, now they're looking to hire others to come in and take other jobs because if that cleaner now, you know, gets injured and, and can't work, well, it's not a huge load to now spread out among other cleaners. Yeah. If they're working 40 hours plus, and they go down. Now you got to spread out those jobs to a small team. But if it's 15 hours less, it'll be a lot easier to move pieces around in that instance. So yeah. I think that's actually a good thing to have is kind of capping your capping your independent contractors or employees at a certain set of hours a week so that they have that freedom and it gives you kind of that personal, I guess, clear head to know that if something did happen, you have backup options to go through with that. You, you mentioned booking Koala now with ease of access and helping you open up your time. Let's, let's go into the software now. Is that the first software you, you started with when you started your your business in 2018 or did you try others and and then come over we we've looked at several dozen software companies over the years um booking koala wasn't the first one we uh there was another company that was actually very similar to booking koala that we used first um but they had some issues a couple of years back they were trying to like update to this really different version of their of their um, software and they did a really bad job of transitioning everybody and their customer service department was just terrible to work with. They're they They always try to blame it on like user error instead of just, <laughs> just admitting that the software didn't work right. And, um, you know, we, we found booking Koala. I think somebody, um, referred us to you guys in one of the Facebook groups that we were part of and we checked it out. And to be honest, like the company we we're using previously, they, I think they're like at least four times more expensive than Booking Koala. And they have pretty much all the same features that Booking Koala offers. So like bang for your buck, you're getting way more from Booking Koala than you are any other software that's out there. Um, and we look at software like every year, we're always looking around to see, is there new software available that can help us like automate certain things? Is there software that can help us do things differently? So we're, we're always looking around and we haven't found anything that's been better than booking Koala, especially when you consider the price for it. It's insane. Like I, I, I think you guys could probably charge more and still get away with it. Don't do that. <laughs> but you could. I, I mean, if if we did if we did raise prices everybody who's already with us we grandfathered in it would go forward again that's i know different conversation for a different time but that is huge for you to say that and i appreciate that because we we pride ourselves in 
not gouging people for what they need to run a business. We understand that you guys are your business owners too. It it's it takes a lot to run a business, but it shouldn't break somebody's bank, especially when you're putting your entire business in a software where it costs a lot of money from your pocket to use and it's not working properly or yeah. there's con constant outages or you know not frequent enough updates and things like that there are times where their updates can be slower or you know response times can take a little bit longer but we pride ourselves with having customer service that goes in depth as much as possible and and helps i don't want to say handhold but in a sense like show you how how to use it and not make you feel like you're to blame because you can't use the software we know it's big we know it's it's meant to be used by every single service industry and every different way you want to run it so there are a lot of options and that's why we make sure our customer service team is knowledgeable and knows how to handle these conversations. Yeah, and I can vouch for that. I know that when we first started using Booking Koala, I think it took me about two months, two to three months before I was really kind of comfortable with it. And I understood like, you know, if I tug on this thread, it's going to do this over here. Because uh, there's a lot of different options, <laughs> you know, a lot of different ways you can customize the software. Um, but I, I probably wrote into customer service once a day, at least once a day, asking some question. And like, I never felt like you guys were annoyed at me or uh, were, were like, oh, this guy again, kind of a thing. It's just everybody was always super helpful. If they didn't know the answer, they researched it. They always got back to me after a few days. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think customer service wise, you guys do a great job. You know, I, I've never had an issue. We appreciate that. With all the features that are in it what what are you using most what are what can you really not live without at this point uh well definitely the online booking i, I think that's you know kind of the bread and butter of it you know the fact that people can come to the website and you know i wake up in the morning and i have notifications saying like you have new bookings and i didn't have to do anything you know just completely automated it assigned it to the to the right people and um that whole task, you know, if if we were to do it manually, it would take a long time. But as it is today, my wife and I might respond to five emails a week, you know, because Booking Koala kind of takes care of everything else. And there's a couple of things here and there that like we have to jump in and help out with. But for the most part, it just goes on its own. So I would say, yeah, the, the, the booking is, is the biggest part of it. Besides booking, what would you say next would be? Because I know... That's a common answer, and I know it's it's huge, and that's vital for a lot of people. Yeah. But beside that core feature or scheduling, you know, would it be the checklists, or I don't know if you're using the hiring module, or if you're using the email campaigns or the leads, would it be any of those things? Um, you know, we we don't subscribe to the tier that gives us access to that right now. We um, so I would say like billing is the biggest part for us. Um, the fact that we can, you know, put people's cards on hold, you know, a few days before we actually go there to make sure they can pay for it. That's been huge because I, I remember when we first started and we were using other software, we didn't do that. And there were a couple of times where we got caught and, you know, the, we did a big job, you know, two or four people are at a cleaning and it's a move out cleaning. It took all day. And then all of a sudden we go to charge the card and it didn't work. So trying to chase down the customer in that kind of a situation really sucks. And uh, it sucks even more when payday rolls around and you're, you're, you know, clutching your purse strings trying to figure out how am I going to do this? Am I going to be able to make payday or not? So that in and of itself, the, the automated billing system is just, you know, a lifesaver for us. And how far in advance have you set up your card hold? Uh, 24, 48? We do, I believe it's 48 hours. So, yeah, I think it's two days beforehand is when it charges the card or it puts a hold on the card anyway. And the reason we did that is because, you know, if, if the cleaning is on a Wednesday, um, we're putting the hold on the card on Monday, 
if it doesn't work, then we have a full 24 hours to try to fix it with the client. Um, you know, and, and they send out the reminder emails, letting them know to, you know, update their card and things like that. So that's another headache taken off of our plate, but it gives them enough time, you know, to, to update their card on file. And, and then it, usually it's just fine after that. I think that 72, 48 to 72 hour window is the sweet spot for the card hold. Cause like you said, it gives you that two, three days to either fix it with the customer and contact them. Hey, card didn't go through. Oh, sorry. I'll give you another one. Or if they're not getting back to you, then okay. Now you have time to remove it and fill that with another booking so that you're, you're still getting some revenue in and, and your employees getting some work in as well. I think anything sooner than that, anything sooner than 72 hours is just too long in advance. And the customer might be like, well, why, why are you charging my card four or five days before, you know, it's way, way too soon to take the money. Um, it, it is a, a hold. It's not like they're getting charged, but essentially they see the money out of their account. But with that 72, 48 hour to 72 hour hold, that's, I feel like it, nobody I've talked to has had an issue with customers within that time span. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree. A feature that we don't have that you're dying to have. Tell me about it. Um, I think what would make booking Koala like just really help save people a lot of time is if there were more rules around when bookings could be made. Uh, the issue you run into when you open up your cleaning schedule for customers online to choose when it's convenient for them to have a cleaning is you can end up with large gaps in your schedule. Like you may have a cleaner who has a cleaning in the morning and they're done by let's say like 11 or noon. And then the next person comes in and they don't schedule something until like two or three. So then you got like this gap in your schedule now. So there's at least, I would say at least an hour of revenue that's missing there that you could have probably filled in. I know some companies do, you know, like the arrival windows, you know, like, uh, you know, a two hour arrival window, something like that. Um, so for them, it may not be as big of a deal. We tried that when we first started and we were really surprised by how many people couldn't understand the difference between an arrival window and how long the cleaning would actually take. So many people were confused and they thought that the cleaning would only take two hours. And so we switched to doing exact arrival times. And for us, it worked better because we could manage our cleaner schedules better. They knew exactly when they had to be at a job. They, they knew exactly how long the job would take. So they knew how much they were gonna make that week. And we knew exactly when we could schedule the next job after that. Um, but going back to kind of my original point, like when you have those gaps in your schedule like that, it would be really nice if there were some rules that we could set in the system that says like, you know, don't allow a job at the end of the day if it's really far away from the office, because that costs me money to have the person come back to the office to drop off their equipment. Or don't allow a move out cleaning, which could take you know, longer than the estimated amount of time to start in the afternoon, only allow it to start in the morning times. Um, things like that, like certain rules just to, um, or even like if a customer really wants to book out, let, let's say, let's say there's a cleaning that ends at 11 and they don't want their cleaning to start until three and you've got this gap in an employee's schedule from 11 to three, I'd love it if we could just say like, hey, if you want to schedule a three o'clock appointment, we're charging you for the two hours prior to that, that we've lost in revenue because you decided to schedule the job, you know, so late in the afternoon. Um, and it's one of those things, like, I think customers, if they understand it costs more to book a certain job at a certain hour, then at least it's up front and they know what the cost is and they're willing to accept it or not. Uh, but for us, like, you know, the end of the day is five o'clock. So if you have a two hour job that comes in at three and it blocks you from taking a four hour job, that kind of sucks. You know, you lose that revenue. Absolutely. The employee is sitting idle. They, they're not making as much money as they wanted to make that week. So I think like giving us more customization about the types of rules around when certain types of jobs can be booked and where is really helpful. Um, and again, like I know not all companies have like an office location where employees pick up and drop off equipment. 
But if you do that travel time to and from the office, that adds up. That's really, really expensive. Even if you have a storage unit, you still have to pay your employees to drive to and from that storage unit. And it's one of those things where like, you don't want them sitting in rush hour traffic coming back from a cleaning at five o'clock and then trigger overtime because of that traffic or something like that. Like that's, that's a big expense and it's hard to plan for, you know, you really can't, you know, it, it's a lot tougher to adjust in your, in the pricing of, of your bookings. And uh, you could end up pricing yourself out of the market if you're trying to adjust and accommodate for that kind of a situation that you really can't control. So I think that would be the number one thing. Cause that's sure. You do that, and like all of a sudden, the other twenty five percent of my job is automated completely. That was yeah, and the super interesting because I've never really heard it in this way because I've I've heard people talk about it and mention it, like you said, those gaps in the middle of the day where you know there's two and a half hour window where cleaner can't really get a big clean in, and it's not really worth. Or maybe it's an hour and a half window. We can't really get a two hour booking in and one hour is too short. Well, you would have people, you know, some in the community group say, well, then just that's why we call every customer and, and we don't guarantee every booking. We make sure we stack it. But there goes your automation. Exactly. There, there goes your extra time. Yeah. And I've talked, I've talked to several companies and a lot of companies still do it that way. Even the big franchises still do it that way. And, you know, they, they have a lot of them have like a central customer service team somewhere in the U S that kind of handles some, some of that um, task, but it's one of those things where it's something that could easily be programmed into a computer and automated. There's no reason to staff a human being to do that because I mean, depending on how busy you are, you know, are you really going to spend, you're really going to pay somebody to sit on the phone eight hours a day when maybe they're only making two hours worth of phone calls a day. It's, it's kind of, you know, you have to have somebody to, to make, to pick up that phone. Right. And at the end of the day, the things that that person is doing, they're just looking at data in the computer to make decisions. Who is available at three o'clock? <laughs> you don't need a person. Right. To do it. Um, so yeah, I, I think like, and the system, I mean, the scheduling already has it where they obviously know not to overbook they know when a job is supposed to end like even if you're using arrival windows like yeah i mean it, it could be a, it, something as it's simple there as, like if you have a uh, a cleaning category of like move out services you just say like hey don't allow move out cleaners to start past i don't know noon or something like that you know and you you could set different settings for each cleaning category if you wanted to do something like that but i, I think that would be a huge huge time saver you know, a big time cost saver. And uh, it, it frees you up to really kind of focus on the things that are really important in the company. And that's developing and hiring and training your staff. That That's the thing that, you know, that's the most valuable thing that a person needs to do that a computer can't really handle. You know, your computer can handle everything schedule related. That's fine. But people need to be around people. So I, I think that that's, that's where you should put your, your money at. And the more automation you could add to like, like exactly like you just said, the more automation you could put in where I hate to use the word waste of time for a human body person to do this. It's just time consuming and basically essentially a waste of time when if you could get the system to do it why not have it set up that way stack the bookings make sure everything's as tight as possible and then you could focus on hiring you could focus on marketing and other things i know the software has the the daily discounts where if you know tuesday's your slowest day you can set it up coupons and stuff and then send out the coupons to your customers to push them to book instead of, you know, stacking your Friday, Saturday, Sundays earlier in the week, you could get them over, but adding these rules in, I think would be a huge, huge game changer. I'm sure we're working on some, but have you, have you told our support team or have you added it to our feature request page? 
I haven't had a chance yet. I think just figuring out the right way to word it is probably what stops me and, you know, just time in general. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, if, if that's something you guys want me to do, I'll, I'll try to put something together and put it in there. Absolutely. If even if you can do a screen share of your account saying like, hey, like showing us what you think in your eyes, how you would like it to be. And then sending it over to our, our team, we would send it over to the development team and they would take a look and go back and forth with you to make sure it's it's set up the right way and it, have as many different avenues and options that can work for not just yourself, but everybody else, you know? That's... I, I can tell you now, like, I don't, I haven't seen any other company do that. None. Like, they, they all either automate the booking process kind of like what booking koala does um or they have their software set up so that it will take in the request for a cleaning but there has to be some sort of a customer service staff that calls them back to confirm everything and then put the actual appointment somewhere on the calendar um so i yeah if you guys were to do something like that you would be like the only ones in this field that did it that's something that if you got time in the next couple days can put that together and send it over you could send it to me send okay. it over to me and i'll i'll uh i'll give it to our team and they'll uh they'll look into it and for sure see i haven't checked recently where the feature request page stands because i know we get things added in daily whether it's from email or straight to that page um, maybe it's already in there, but if it's not, we would love to have it. So, cause I, I personally, I see the, the huge use case out of it and I'm sure others will too, as well. I mean, some have already mentioned it as a pain point and they've had to restructure kind of a little bit how their business operates to move around that. But if we can get that added in, it's going to save a lot of time and headaches and streamline everything. I think that one downside to a feature like that is you may reduce the size of like a support staff um, for a company, uh, but hopefully those people could be retrained to help out in other areas. Because the amount of time and money you spend not having to deal with scheduling stuff like that, you could probably put into marketing and, and get those people to help out there. Well, that would be my guess anyway, but um, yeah, it's yeah. Have an internal marketing team, whether they're working on blog posts for SEO or, or just content for social media for sure. Apps and integrations. What would you, instead of like core features, what are you using QuickBooks? Do you have the Facebook and Google logins enabled? We. I think we do. I don't think very many people use the Facebook or Google login uh, for us. I think most people just, you know, use their, uh, their email and a password. Um, we have Zapier, I think is one of the, the big things that we kind of use to integrate with stuff. We do have QuickBooks um, just because of the way our accounting works. It's easier for us not to like uh, connect it to booking Koala. Um, but I, I can, I can definitely see the value in that <laughs> if if, uh, if uh, we had done it differently when we first started. Um, but for us, it's just a little bit easier to connect it to our bank account and then do everything out of that versus, you know, every single person that comes through. Um, I think a big part of that, too, is because we have uh, Stripe and you can look at a lot of the customer breakdowns in Stripe, um, which is, I think, one of the benefits connecting to QuickBooks would be. But um, again, I've never really connected QuickBooks to Booking Koala, so I, I can't say for sure. I think that's pretty much it. You know, we're we're pretty simple in, in how we use Booking Koala. We don't have a whole lot connected to it. I think if we were a bigger company, we might. But You mentioned Zapier. Zapier, I always pronounce it either wrong or I switch it up. Um, but what Zaps do you have set up uh, that will work in between what do you what do you have set up for that so we we have some third-party software like we use a, a another app for texting that allows our um, employees to communicate with the clients when they're in the field and we also have a uh an email 
um, what do you call it? Like Help Scout. We use Help Scout also for our emails. So when a new customer books, we use a zap that sends their information to those apps. That way it's it's preloaded and we don't have to like manually add you know, a new customer contact info to the texting app. Because something, you know, before we integrated everything like that with Zapier, we would forget to put the new customer's name in the texting app. And then we would go to text the customer to let them know that we were outside or something and their information wouldn't be in there. So we'd have to, you know, open up booking Koala and find it and manually type it in, which is fine for us because we have permissions to view all of that, but our employees um, can't see like their phone number or email address or anything. They just see a name. So for them, they can't go in and do that. So having Zapier automatically upload a new customer into those, um, platforms is really helpful. It saves us a lot of just kind of tedious effort. For sure. And again, I feel like you have streamlined your account to be as automated as possible or as closely as possible to reduce the tasks that you don't necessarily need to do because the system can do it for you. I know the other business owners, I don't, want to necessarily say that they like to do it, but they're obviously still doing it for a reason. Um, cause the system, there's plenty of things that the system does that they still prefer to do manually, which yeah. is fine. Again, that's why the system exists. It's built for everyone to run it, how they see fit and the best, best fit for them. Um, but would you would you say you're automated to the most that you could be with the system? Or do you think there's still more that you could do with um, what's inside now? You know, the one thing I have wanted to do is, you know, check out the hiring portal and the new version of the, um, the checklists and the email campaigns. Uh, we're just, we're not really at a point right now where we need all of that stuff. Um, we use MailChimp we, in the past, you know, for, for email campaigns, but we, we really, we noticed that like not a lot of people were engaging with the emails and they weren't really clicking through. So until I'm at a point where I can hire somebody who knows how to do that better than me, it's kind of not really necessary for me to do that because my efforts weren't working. So. All right. Well, final question here, kind of my favorite one. If you're going to look back at October of 2018 or somebody who's going to be watching this interview who's on the fence or looking to get started what are those words of of affirmation what are what what would you tell them to get them to get started yeah you mean get started like on booking koala or in the business in general in the business in general with booking koala anything okay I, I would tell them, you know, jump in there and, you know, get your hands dirty. It's, it's important to know exactly what it's like to be out in the field. Um, do things that, you know, take the long way around doing things at first so you can figure out what steps are involved and kind of slowly figure out how to be more efficient and how to automate things and, and make things better over time. And um, pinch every dollar. I would say, like, you don't have to go out and spend a bunch of money to make it look like, you know, you're this big fancy company, you know, really, really kind of think about it and think like, is this worth the cost? Is there another way I can do it? Can I do it like with manual effort versus paying for it? Um, th th those are the things that I would tell somebody, you know, at the very beginning and, and definitely seek help, you know, join some communities, talk to a lot of people. Um, we, before we decide to start our own company, we talked to a lot of franchises because we thought maybe it would be worth it to join a franchise that has like a proven sort of playbook and know exactly what to do. But after talking to the franchises, we realized that like everything that they provided, we could do ourselves and for far less. Um, I don't think everybody's going to be that way. Um, I, I happen to have, you know, a background in some web design, so I knew I could build my own website. I didn't need theirs. You know, uh, I had worked in the tech field for a while, so I was familiar with building out various types of playbooks. So there's a lot of stuff that we were able to do on our own because we had the background for it. Um, 
but I, w- I would caution people like if you're thinking about going to that franchise or you're thinking about buying all this big fancy equipment like just don't do it you know <laughs> get out there and and start with the basics and work your way up from there you'll save a ton of money and especially if you talk to other business owners you'll learn the mistakes that they made and that will save you a bunch of money too for sure awesome fits it was a pleasure Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today and sharing your story and your journey with us. And we wish you nothing but the best. Hopefully we'll get to talk to you in the next year or two and see the progress and see where you guys are at at that point. All right. Thank you so much.